So some of the questions will get addressed during the course of the presentation itself. And if there's something left over from the ambassador, just let me know and then answer those also. I've noted down a few that are left over. So uh, with that, uh, we go into the presentation itself. Now, uh, I have said understanding puberty and autism, but that's because that is my experience, both with my son, who is a person with autism, he's 24 years old, and also the major population I work with at my center also are uh, young men or boys. So that is where my experience is, but I think it will apply across uh, other special needs, and major part of the presentation will apply to girls also. So I hope it's useful for everybody there. So we will be covering uh, in this order, we'll be talking about the biological changes that happen and why they happen in terms of the hormones, what are the hormones, because getting an understanding of uh, the impact of these hormones uh, will may let us understand our child much better during puberty and how uh, many of the things are what happens to all of us for one, and secondly, uh, it's out of their hands. It's not something you're doing on purpose. And uh, the next uh, uh, part of the presentation will talk about what is it that we need to teach and how to teach in terms of the health and hygiene and uh, sexuality, independence, uh, uh, self-esteem, self-care, things like that. And also puberty is a period when the uh, child goes through a lot of challenges in terms of stress, and it manifests in the form of anxiety, aggression, rage, and many other issues. So we will just briefly touch upon, uh, you know, what are the issues and what uh, probably possibly we can do to alleviate these issues. So going into the first uh, part, which is understanding the hormonal changes and uh, what are the physical changes due to that and sensory issues. So this is the underlying part. I'm not talking about the physical features of the body, but what is going inside the body is what I'm gonna talk about. So what happens in puberty, which is the age between, puberty actually refers to the term of attaining the sexual maturation. So the period is more uh, called adolescence, between the ages of 10, 11 years to about 19, 20 years, that period, where there are all the changes that are happening, that is called adolescence. So that is a time where lot of areas change. Of course, the physical area changes. We also change emotionally. There are a lot more emotions that we become aware of, uh, and uh, some related to our sexual needs, some also relating to our need for independence and the uh, need for you know uh, uh, creating our own identity. And that is the period when we create our identity. There are, uh, it's a period where the, it, uh, the cognitive functions, the intelligence consolidates itself. If you look at uh, GIF, John Piaget, who is uh, a, a psychologist, he talks about that period where a uh, lot of things consolidate comprehension, abstract thinking, uh, even metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. These kind of things happen in this uh, period of adolescence and uh, even uh, theoretical thinking, putting up a hypothesis and trying to prove it logically or disprove it. A lot of things change uh, cognitively. And uh, also uh, from the external world, we suddenly say the child is no longer a child. We tell the child that you're a big boy or a big girl and you're expected to behave in very, very uh, you know, new ways suddenly. This overnight, uh, we expect that just because the guy has grown taller, that uh, you know they need to behave in a certain way. There's also a lot of peer pressure at this uh, age, and there is, uh, of course, the need, uh, you know, the sexual awareness and uh, need for relationships with the opposite sex or those kind of. Things. And of course, uh, there are many. Uh, behavioral changes because of all these things that they have to go through. They also have uh, behavioral changes which are mainly connected to their privacy. For example, they may want to shut themselves in a room. They may not want to talk. These are things that happen even with uh, persons with uh, disabilities as much as they happen with uh, you know typical persons. 
and uh, there are concerns about safety that we are worried about their safety both uh, you know sexual uh, safety abuse related safety even you know uh, there is a, a tendency to explore and uh, you know uh, there could be a lack of fear with some children risk taking may be there uh, as well as there could be challenging behavior which is related to their disability so why does this happen this is because at that point all at once if you look at the screen it looks very complicated so many hormones are released all at once at least five types of hormones one of them is the growth hormone which is right here uh, which uh, sort of helps the child to grow physically in terms of the bones and the muscles and then there is the sex hormone in the case of uh, boys it is called the luteinizing hormone which uh, in turn generates the testosterone and the physical the uh, features sexually sex uh, related features uh, are uh, you know triggered by this hormone the thyroid also triggers in this age uh, and uh, so that that is the next thing and there are there are the cortisol and the corticosteroids these are hormones which are protecting the immune system itself so they uh, they are generated so that in this age since the child is at a delicate age they are there to protect the child from the stress actually the corticosteroids and of course in case of the gen the prolactin and all these kind of hormones so what happens is all these things they do confuse the body they do confuse the brain and the, the hormonal changes itself will cause certain discomfort for the child and have negative sort of uh, you know they feel a little not very themselves you know till they settle in they feel a little different and uh, their body is changing they have new uh, things in their body that they you know the girl develops breasts the guy develops the genitals the penis and so they could be a negative effect for example because of the uh, elongation of the penis the way they you know even pass uh, their toilet training may go for a sick because they are not able to control it in the same way so they could be just because of the physical changes negative effect and also as i said the social uh, you know, expectations and pressure can cause certain oh, negative yeah. behavior and the fact that yeah. their brain is not matching the physical development that also the, uh, may cause the imbalance which will contribute to the challenging behavior so it is a really difficult phase for any for a child or any person uh, going through irrespective of their ability and so what happens is the stress level is really high and the response of the body as i said earlier for to stress is producing cortisol which is to protect us so even if we have a, a burn or a cut the body produces cortisol but when there is excess cortisol what happens is that it goes and suppresses the thyroid yeah so the thyroid is required for to keep the body healthy and working the metabolic system is controlled by the thyroid so if that is inhibited because of the excess stress then it can lead to physical problems like you know the child may have a lot of tiredness or a lot of allergies and colds or it could be sort of being confused and having memory problems or dry skin various things like that so all these you know they it can right. just uh, it's like almost an unpredictable sort of a uh, you know path that we are going through uh, and it is uh, not to scare all of you but to keep all of this in mind that the child may be going through any of these uh, which is very important yeah and uh, and also physically the sensory systems are also changing if you look at the tactile system right on top you have the uh, upper layer which is the epidermis which is related which has a hair follicles and the nerves which are uh, you know the uh, which detect the light touch and this uh, these nerves are getting adapted for sexual touch so hence they go undergo a change so you will find the child maybe exploring more in the tactile system you know touching their own skin wanting to touch others so the tactile system may be out of balance and there is also the lower part of the skin uh, where the proprioceptive sense the nerves uh, get the information for deep pressure vibration which help in the movement 
and that may not be getting enough uh, information because the uh, upper level is so active so uh, you know uh, you will see things like the child may become more ticklish or seek more tactile contact and pressure they may have of course physical things like more sweating or facial acne and they may uh, have new preferences for clothing they may say no i don't want to wear you know this material or uh, this type of clothing and uh, the proprioceptive system also as i said during this period even for regular uh, teenagers they could have uh, you know they may be more prone to falls and fractures because they even have growing pains that's a normal thing that they talk about and uh, the coordination may go out of uh, you know balance there they could be clumsy they could be sloppy you know they could hunch their uh, back and uh, they could also be hyperactive in the sense that because the proprioceptive system is not getting feedback they are not able to sit in one place uh, you know they are constantly seeking feedback in that system so they could be more uh, you know moving around a lot more uh, also since um, the smell system is also related to sexuality so that system is also triggered more in puberty and they may want to smell everything they become more aware of smell and taste the taste may change they may have more uh, they may want more you know spicy food or junk food uh, because all this is related to smell system which is uh, triggered at this age and uh, the the positive part of the smell system being triggered is that unlike all the other sensory systems uh, which need to go through the sensory processing through the brain in order to uh, come out with the response. the smell system directly reaches the limbic system so with smell one can also help them to calm down or regulate so this is something i want you all to remember that is a very important tool to help the child to regulate themselves without having to think whether this is what they need to do yeah the brain is also changing a lot there is a lot of neurons firing in this age in adolescence as much almost like you know from the 0 to 6 you say there are a lot of neurons firing again at this age there is a lot of neurons firing as i said uh, it is the age where the brain consolidates all its functions and so um, it also does a lot of pruning of unnecessary uh, things so it is a time when even the cognitively the brain is uh, doing a lot of changes and the prefrontal cortex cortex right here uh, is also developing at this age and uh, it goes on developing in fact till the age of 26 the prefrontal cortex uh, develops and it uh, that is where responsible for right and wrong decision making making the right choice self regulation so it is a very important part that is developing at this age in fact in the us they don't allow a person to rent a car till they are 26 because they feel they have not got the judgment till that age to drive the car properly so even though they give the license at a very early age they, the renting is not allowed so uh, that is uh, also happening at this age and uh, they are getting physically mature but emotionally our children with autism or other disabilities may not be able to match up the development that causes a lot of disturbances and uh, about 30 to 40 percent of uh, ad uh, adolescents with uh, autism and other disabilities may have an uh, increase in anxiety, increase in aggression, they may have more meltdowns. One in four uh, persons on the spectrum have a risk for seizures and uh, they have a risk for, uh, you know, uh, many disorders which I have listed there like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, sleep disturbances, oppositional defined disorder, which means they will say they'll oppose whatever you say. Uh, that's quite normal of a teen, isn't it? And uh, they could have depression and mood disorders. So, how do we take care of this child? We are talking about so many issues uh, that they may have physically. How do we take care of the mental and physical health of this child? Uh, how do we reduce the stress and anxiety? So I've just briefly gone ahead and talked about uh, those things. So the first thing is how do we recognize that the child is uh, 
stressed out. We may have a child who is not able to express and say, Mom, I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling very worried or very anxious. And that is something we need to teach them to do. But there are also very uh, somatic, as we call it, or physical uh, you know, uh, level features that will indicate to us their digestion may get affected, their muscles may be more you know, stiff, or they could be trembling. Uh, you know, they, they, they could be constipated or having diarrhea. They may eat a lot or they may not eat at all. They may be, you know, uh, breathing very quickly and deeply. Uh, their mouth might go dry often. Their eyes may dilate. So these are all uh, signs of stress that we can look out for. So to reduce stress, these are uh, techniques that I've listed here are universal for everybody, each one of us. Diet, exercise, and sleep. Nothing can be said less about that. You need to do that for sure. Uh, specifically for persons with uh, on the spectrum, uh, massages and deep pressure may help because, as I said, the proprioceptive system is getting less input at this age. So, giving um, regular, uh, you know, deep massages, aroma therapy will help because, as I said, it directly the sense of smell goes to the limbic system, the amygdala, which is the seat of emotion, and it helps them to calm down. And uh, music might help uh, also. These are non-invasive things that you can try to reduce the stress. And the regular, uh, you know, therapeutic methods of having a sensory diet, having positive behavioral supports, which means uh, you, you know, you understand your child, you go by their learning style, you scaffold their learning, and having things that positive engagement, meaning things to do, which they like to do, they're good at doing. And they also need to have a lot of choice and independence. Till this age, till the age of 10, you may have controlled the child a lot. But uh, at this age, you'll find them going literally out of control because they want to establish their own boundaries and their own identity. So it is good as a parent to be prepared for, to give a little more choice to them. Yeah. There are a lot of medical therapies that can be done in consultation with a doctor. And I would say that these have to be done only as a last resort. If all these other things are in place and still the, the child is not able to sort of uh, be treated, then, you know, one needs to do the medical therapies. And in consultation with a doctor, I'm not going to read these out. I think most of you know. Uh, and I am not a doctor, so I don't know about these drugs. But I do believe that for some children, uh, for uh, some uh, you know period of time, in order to be functional, they may need some medication. Uh, yeah, and uh, it should be done always in consultation with a doctor. We can, of course, as I said, it is a period where the body changes a lot. The thyroid system is triggered. So a lot, and the, because of stress also, there could be uh, food-related issues. So to do uh, studies of the uh, gut, uh, if there are symptoms, if there are symptoms or allergy tests, and doing a blood, you know, doing like a master health checkup, where everything is uh, looked into once a year, I think is worth it for a teenager. Though we normally start doing this only once people are older, I think teenage is a very crucial age where we do these tests, look at vitamins and minerals, look at the trace elements, copper and zinc, if they go out of balance, can cause behavioral issues. Um, you know, so looking at thyroid, whether that is uh, having a problem, uh, the child may be, may be anemic, that can also cause uh, difficulty in concentration, performance, and all that. So once a year, start doing these tests. And it also, in fact, I, I believe in uh, going to the doctor every uh, three to six months, only to even get the child used to going to a doctor because we don't want them to go only in an emergency. And at that time, they don't have the skills to, you know, they're so scared of this new place and all the equipment. And so it is good to do a blood draw once a year and just get them to visit the doctor and dentist once in three to six months, so that they are used to these places. Yeah, dental health is also important, though I've not listed it over here. The other thing is, if there are, uh, you know, if you suspect that the child may have epilepsy, if he's freezing at some times, or he's having some tremors, 
or there are some skin lesions uh, again you know maybe you may need to do an eeg or mri and uh, in some cases the doctor if there are metabolic signs may also ask you to do a genetic profiling for uh, chromosomal analysis and fragile x and it is good to know all these things you know about your child rather than just thinking everything is because of the disability autism or other disability and if many of the children again i see 30 to 40% of the children developing that related issues at this age they tend to eat a lot of uh, food that is not healthy for them and uh, they they if they are showing signs like uh, frequent you know uh, bowel movement or constipation or smelly gas etc or you know overeating or not eating at all these are all the symptoms then uh, maybe it is worth checking out first of all if there are issues and if there are then the uh, doctor may uh, suggest i i have personally found uh, you know i also have personally gut issues and i found a lot of relief with a vegan diet and uh, using digestive enzymes increasing raw food of course these are all general uh, common sense things one thing i found really useful for my son at one point when he was 16 or 17 he was having a lot of uh, behavioral issues and meltdown and he is non verbal he communicates using uh, avas uh, and uh, typing on the ipad so when i uh, chatted with him and he kept telling me that he's having uh, stomach pain and pain in the stomach and i just realized that i hadn't done the deworming for him for a, a year or so so i gave him the deworming tablets and lo and behold he was feeling better and uh, so i do that more regularly now and i also use naturopathic ways of neem and castor oil uh, every month and if i feel the symptoms are increasing then i use the uh, allopathic deworming again check with your doctor but this uh, you know just having a bad stomach pain can cause behavioral issues so one needs to ensure that body is in sync before we go into other things yeah so it's very important to uh keep the reduces right do medical screening uh, and treatment and see if the diet needs to be modified or the diet. diet is a tough one because this is the age when they want to eat junk food and then we are telling them to go on a diet so we have to be really creative with the way we uh, i i cook a lot of junk food at home <laughs> that's how I cook because my son is a food yeah and then uh, the next step is to understand see most of the time we think that puberty it'll just you know the just a phase and once they are 18 19 they're going to get over all these issues but that is not true we need to give them proper training uh, at puberty for the skills just like we look at academics it is important to have a proper curriculum for puberty to look at the gap areas and to you know look at um, how we are going to teach these skills uh, to also to adapt them according to the ability of the child so the first thing is to have the curriculum in all these areas to understand their own body understand hygiene sexuality safety etc so i'm going to talk about uh, what could should be there in the curriculum yeah so uh, they don't pick it up all on their own by just listening to a friend most of us at least i remember my mom was very uh, not comfortable talking to me about pubertal changes but at around 10 11 years old i heard it from my friends about menstruation or how the body is going to change but our children may not be able to pick it up that way they may not have friends who share this with them and even if they do share they may not because of the theory of mind and other issues they may not really understand that it may happen to them also they may hear about mm -hmm. Uh, you know their bodily changes or sex or sexuality for mothers or they may even uh, have a sex uh, class in the school but they may not really understand it till it happens to them so it is important to have a curriculum so what do you teach in the curriculum you teach all the body parts it's not just the sexual body parts but the child needs to know all their body parts and they you teach about how to keep themselves clean 
not only in the curriculum, but it's also a very practical, functional exercise how to keep clean. You need to teach them about the concept of public and private, understanding what is privacy. That's a very important concept and what you can do privately. And also about how, what is sexuality, uh, how their body is changing, is it appropriate behavior, when can they, you know, uh, you know, because no behavior by itself is bad. Uh, it is the context that makes it inappropriate, right? So we need to just teach them when it is appropriate to engage in certain behaviors like masturbation. And they also, if they can uh, get it, if they uh, you think the child can understand, you should teach them about uh, the importance of contraception and childbirth because we want them to be aware of that if they're going to get sexually active. The other things to teach are to be able to protect themselves, the safety aspect. And very important, the basic skill in that is the ability to say no. Very often, we don't teach the child to say no. So that itself comes in the way of their safety. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So that's an important thing to teach. It's also important to teach them what are their rights and what are their responsibilities. What are the responsibilities towards themselves, towards the family, towards the society and community. And to think, this is a period to think about what is going to be the purpose of their life. What is going to be their vocation? What are they going to become? So that is also very important because then their self-esteem will uh, build up and they need to learn to express feelings and emotions. So you need to have a curriculum for that and a curriculum uh, to help them how to become more autonomous or independent and uh, make their own choices and live by them. So initially we'll talk about the physical body parts uh, and uh, all that and then go into the each of those areas. So when you look at puberty in boys, this is something all of you are aware of. I don't need to go through it, I think. There is a rapid uh, growth spur, there is hair growth, there could be erections, acne, uh, there could be wet dreams, the child may be trying to masturbate, there could be changes in the mood and the child may be getting more anxious or more aggressive. So these are all the signs that your child is entering puberty. They say 11 years old, but nowadays they could be at a much younger age that they are attaining puberty. Yeah, so it's very important to teach them the correct names of their body parts and not use some slang kind of name uh, that other people may, they, you know, uh, because it, it is better they use penis or vagina or breast than using some word that, you know, like most of us say susu or pee pee. But uh, somebody else may not understand it. So it is good for them to know I pass urine rather than say those words or in their mother tongue to say that. Yeah. Um, because of, uh, it's also important that in the colloquial sense, wherever you're living, to know what are the words that may be used because other people may use these words to refer to these body parts or uh, to these activities. Uh, for the child, you may need to use a lot of visuals which are explicit or models or even tactile strategies for them to understand about these things. And um, they should understand which parts are private and which parts are uh, okay to be seen by others. And if, whether they are a boy or girl, both of them need to know about the opposite sex also because they are going to be interested in the opposite sex. They are going to become aware about the differences in the sexes. So it is good to teach that also to the child. So there are a few books that are available. They're not very expensive books, but they are very, very useful books uh, just for boys and just for girls. And these are for uh, regular uh, children, uh, typical children, but they are also just as useful for our kids and at least for the parent to know what all is to be covered and what, uh, you know, uh, how it can be taught to the child. It is, these two are very good books. And the third one on the right, which is uh, Adolescence on the Autism Spectrum, A Parent's Guide to Cognitive, Social, Physical and Transition of Teenagers is by Chantal. Cecil Kira is a very good book, comprehensive book about 
you know uh, things you know how uh, what are the things to look out for and what are the strategies it's a good book and also available i think on amazon dot in yeah the next thing we are going to talk so next thing we need to talk about to the children after talking about their body changes is uh, you know the how to keep it clean you know it's very important because there is sweating there is uh, you know uh, masturbation so they may have semen all over so all these kind of things we they need to know how to keep clean so one thing is to tell them that they need to have a wash every day they need to put on deodorant and clean clothes they need to wash their face often because of the acne and clean their teeth because they may be eating a lot so they need to brush often at least twice a day and shower and wash their hair you know at least twice a week you know so you can have these like a visual schedule say have you done this or you could be marking it out and they will with boys they will need to you know learn a new skill of shaving and um, these things have to become a habit it's not a question of you just telling and they'll just pick it up so uh, you have to go through with them for how, however long it takes one month six months one year two years till they get the skill and it becomes a part of their system you know so if i brush i'm going to brush properly for two minutes i'm going to go up down every day so it has to become a habit not a choice so <laughs> so it's very important for them to also understand why these things are important so this is the other book that i recommend which is really good uh, in terms of a uh, curriculum for hygiene and puberty for persons with autism it's like if you know uh, the social story book by carol kri it's similar to that in the in the sense it gives you the scripts for each of the activities uh, in the form of a story in a form of a social story so you can modify it you can create a powerpoint out of it or you can add some pictures or you can just make visuals and or you can make a video but it gives you the basic thing that you should be talking about to your child yeah and if there are issues in these uh, areas Uh, just like any see it is just like toilet training puberty all the effort that you put into toilet training in the ages whatever 0 to 6 7 years old uh, you may need to do that for some children they develop toilet training at 3 years old they are toilet trained some children are go up to 6 7 8 or even later similarly even the adolescents may some of them may get it very easily some of them may take a little more time so we need to Uh, sort of analyze the uh, where there is a problem where they are not getting it where they are not becoming independent why are they prompt dependent etc etc it's a similar way of tackling it uh, and uh, whether it's a motor issue and we need to help them appropriate some of the strategies these are to do with more of a choice are uh, to allow them to choose their own soap and deodorant some of them may have allergies and they may not like to use the soap because it is you know itchy or you may need to find a soap that suits them their uh, skin uh, type as well as uh, uh, you know some like a very soft towel my son for one likes a turkish towel it needs to be a bit rough uh, some may use a washcloth some may use a brush you know so or a scrub and uh, even the toothpaste is the same way so make it something they like to do you know if that is the barrier if, if they can get motivated by the smell of the soap or they can get motivated by the picture of the towel or whatever that is a simple strategy to use and for some of them who are not able to use a razor it may be good to use an electric uh, you know shaver with supervision one warning is that many children i've seen have you know they get obsessed with the shaving bit and they shave all over the body they shave over their legs hands even you know pubic hair and that is a normal thing after some time we just have to teach them that that is which are the areas that you have to shave every day and which area you don't shave it uh so they may need some of them may have you know sensitivity issues hypo hypersensitivity issues so desensitizing just like we did in childhood we may need to do that now and for some of them they may not learn just by visuals 
or by verbal commands you may need to use hand over hand and if you do hand over hand for about a few months it will just become a motor memory and they will be able to learn the skill um, so i already talked about using different products which they may like and uh, of course visual schedule and verbal reminders are the key thing that we all use all the time anyway yeah also it's important for them to know that all this we are doing not just for hygiene but also to look good to look cool to fit in so uh, that may also motivate them to do these activities uh, so teach them what goes with what you know uh, and you know you may want to, we may be outdated you may want to get a sibling or a peer to tell what is in what type of clothes what type of beard for that matter or a hairstyle and because uh, tell them that it's very important to make a good impression on your friends and your teacher and people who are important to them and that may motivate them to stay hygienic uh, you know look good so that's another thing so uh, the next topic that you need to have in your curriculum is teaching about public and private so a private space is defined for a child or for all of us is a place where there is nobody else and no one can see you so uh, you need to define that very clearly in that in that kind of space uh, terms like you know nobody can see you and uh, no one else can be there in that room then that's a private space it could be your bedroom with the door closed it could be the toilet with the door closed so you have to specify it. door has to be closed curtains have to be put in then it becomes a private place because nobody can see and a public place is somewhere some place where there are more people more than even one person then if there is you and there is one more person then it becomes a public space yeah so that is something you need to tell them so that way you can even say like you know in a public toilet uh, they may the door is not closed so they may have a doubt that there is somebody else so these kind of exceptions also you may need to talk about yeah and then you have to teach them public and private in terms of space then you have to teach them in terms of activities so what are the activities you can do in a public place what are the activities you can do in a private place so private activities are something that others cannot see where you have to touch your private parts things like you know uh, going to the toilet having a bath these are all private activities so is doing something like masturbation that is also a private activity so you have to put it in that sort of a uh, you know range of things rather than uh, specifically only talking about masturbation talk about all the activities that are private like even digging your nose is not good in private you are putting your hand in the mouth is not good in private putting your hand in the back is not good good in public so these are things that you need to emphasize and you can use this uh, same strategies that you used to teach other things Uh, you can use matching sorting social stories uh, you know visuals the same strategies can be used to teach public and private and the other thing is talking about what parts of the body are pri private and what parts of the body are public yeah so usually a simple thing will say whatever is covered by your underwear is a private uh, thing and you should not show this to others and other things that are not covered by your underwear it's okay those things others can see and uh, once they understand the private parts and the public body parts uh, you can uh, also teach them about not touching uh, the private uh, others private parts you know that nobody can touch your private part and you cannot touch another person's private part and you have to ask before even touching another person even in the public uh but you cannot just touch it. and uh, you can teach them about knocking the door to respect another person's privacy and these are things that you can introduce at this stage so there is a whole curriculum that can be made available for this the resources that you can go to for the curriculum uh, this is a very good website kidshelp.org Uh, which has the curriculum videos and resources it's available in audio mode also so even kids who cannot read they can listen to the thing and there is a quiz at the end of the uh, session it is all quite textual 
So if a child is not used to text, you may need to take the curriculum from that and make it into visuals. Yeah. And so for the visuals, this is another website, livingwellwithautism.com, which has a few, few social stories for this sort of uh, teaching. I'll just share an example, uh, which is for personal space, which is saying that what is personal space and uh, what is too close and what is just right. It's an arm's length that is just right. And what happens if you become too close? People feel scared or uncomfortable. Or what happens when I give place and people are comfortable, so they talk to me or they play with me. So this sort of thing, this sort of story will help them to understand about personal space. And these are available on this website, livingwellwithautism.com. Yeah. So there are lots more. Even today in the WhatsApp group, I saw a very good presentation on, uh, you know, uh, which is a social story to teach a child about puberty and all the skills. So there is a lot available on the net. You don't need to go around recreating the wheel. So once they understand about their body, health and hygiene, private and public, you can talk to them about sexuality, which is the, the uh, new type of sensory feeling that they are having. And one thing is to make it a very normal thing. Uh, uh, it, unfortunately, it is still in our country, uh, you know, a, a much needed topic, which is still very taboo for whatever reason. But uh, the truth is all of us engage in sexual behavior. And it's very natural for a person with disability also to have sexual behavior. As well as they may also, sexuality is not just limited to physical sex or intercourse. It is the whole gamut of feelings that you have to connect to somebody else uh, and be intimate with them and to have a close relationship with them. So it's also a very uh, uh, important thing to teach them that these feelings are okay to feel, you know, have a crush on somebody, to like somebody a lot, want them to be close to you. Uh, those are okay feelings. Um, and uh, about the other things, like whether they have a serious relationship or they engage in sex or they you know or if they get married these are questions that will get answered as they grow up so these are things even for a typical person we can't answer right away right we don't know what their preferences are how their life is going to pan up it's all okay sarah sarah just like for you and me so yeah you need to but teach them and very important to also teach them about consent like I will just share an example here of a young intern that I had. He's still with us. He does some content development work. But he came when he was 17, 18 years old. He's a person uh, not with autism but with several thoughts. And he developed a crush on our sports trainer. So he used to always be staring at her. He used to, you know, uh, want her to give attention to him. He used to uh, message her. And she was also a young person and she did not know how to deal with it. And she was getting very upset that he's uh, behaving this way. So she started ignoring him. So he started getting more, uh, you know, upset that she's not looking at him. So it was creating a lot of issues. So I just had a talk with uh, this young man and I told him that, see, it is okay. It is normal for you to feel uh, uh, attracted to a young person. And, you know, and that the sports trainer, she's a young lady, attractive lady, and it's uh, quite normal that you sort of like her. But it's very important that you don't make her feel that so un uncomfortable, especially because you like her. Do you want her to feel uncomfortable? So I also talked to her and made her talk to him and say that I don't like it when you stare at me. I feel uncomfortable. I don't want to be your friend if you're going to behave in this way. I'm okay if you, you know, if you just behave normally. So then I also told him that it's okay to think in his mind about these things. But he cannot, you know, if it's making the other person uh, uh, uncomfortable, then it's not appropriate for him to express, uh, you know, by staring or sending inappropriate messages. It took him some time and he even cried and he even talked about, will I ever have somebody? who will really like me and will I ever get married? And these are the feelings he had. And we had to talk about all those things. But uh, it was uh, 
at the end of the day, after about two or three weeks, he got the point. So uh, it is very important to talk to them about these things because they do feel, if we just tell them, no, this is bad, you're being bad, you cannot do this, then it really, you know, they don't know how to deal with it. We have to really coach them on how to deal with these feelings. Because the feelings are there. They won't go away just because we say it shouldn't be there or they're bad. Yeah. This is the next point, especially with boys, is uh, to do with masturbation. Girls also masturbate. But then boys often do it in, uh, you know, they're not shy. So they just start, you know, touching their genitals and, uh, you know, try to masturbate in public. And uh, this is a issue faced by uh, us, especially because maybe, you know, they don't understand that this is something they cannot do in public. So the private and public training is very important before we can deal with masturbation. We cannot just tell them, no, don't masturbate. No, that can never be done. So it is important to say, this is a private activity and you cannot, this is a public space. You cannot do it in a public space. You can do it in your bedroom or bathroom with the door shut. So again, I run an adult, uh, uh, adolescent and adult training, skill training program. So many of our uh, interns, individuals used to try to touch their own private parts or they used to try to masturbate during even the class sessions and all that. So we had to constantly for almost, uh, for some cases, for almost six months, redirect them to the toilet uh, and say that this is something you can't do here. If you really feel like it, please go to the toilet. And uh, they got it after some time. And we also had to train the parent to say that allow them to have a private space at home and allow them to you know uh, uh, engage in it at home at particular at a particular time also the time can also be fixed saying that we don't do this all the time we do it only at night or something like that so uh, that really helps when you teach them where to masturbate you know when to masturbate and what to do again like toilet training what to do, you know, how to keep oneself clean after masturbating and stuff like that. So, yeah, so it's very important in the curriculum to teach all these things. And often I, uh, if the, uh, there's a male member in the family, like a father or a grandfather or a brother can help them to learn this. It is most, uh, uh, it is best that they do it. But there is nothing wrong with the mother teaching them as long as the child is not going to confuse that as a sexual act. The other that we've talked about, about private and public and sexuality and masturbation, we worry about abuse and we uh, worry about bullying. So the first skill to avoid abuse is to be able to say no. Can your child say no? Can your child say no if he doesn't uh, want to eat a particular type of food? Can your child say no if he does not want to wear a particular type of dress? Can the child make a choice and say no? So if not, then it's, he's not going to be able to say no to a potential abuser, right? If always you have trained that you have to listen to me and you have, you know, I am an authority figure. So at least with an authority figure, they may not know or say no. So it's very important right from now to start training the child to make a choice and uh, teach them to say, you may have to create sabotage a situation where they're going to say no. And you have to respect that choice. They have to know that if they say no, the adult will respect their choice. So that is a very important skill. I can't emphasize it more in protecting your child from potential abuse or bullying, the ability to say no. Yeah. So once you have taught the child to say no, it is important. We talk about good touch and bad touch. But the more appropriate terms to use is safe touch. <coughs> I'm sorry. It's safe touch and unsafe touch. Uh, it's because we don't want to stigmatize the sexuality. We don't want to say it is a bad thing. It's this okay thing. If it happens between two consenting ad adults, it's a good thing. And if you are uh, pleasuring yourself, that's also a good thing. We're not going to say this is bad. But we're going to say what is safe and what is unsafe. And it is unsafe for a person who you are not interested, you've not given consent to touch you, right? 
and especially if you're a child, you're underage, it is not okay for anybody to touch you in those certain places. So you, the private parts, the mouth, and the other areas that we do not want anyone to touch you, right? So you uh, teach them those safety rules and what to do if somebody teaches, you say no, go tell. That is the thing that you say, you say no, and you run away from that person and you go tell an adult who is safe. So you need to teach them who are the adults who are safe, uh, like the parents, the teachers. So they need to have a list. Who can they tell? Yeah. So the, there are a couple of programs in India which are very good. Uh, Enfold India, they have programs uh, for persons with disabilities also. That's my friend uh, Renu Singh, who's a parent of a girl with autism. She does these trainings and she's also developed, uh, they've developed a kit for children with disabilities. It's not very widely available still because uh, they, they're still, you know, uh, going through the testing phase. But so it will have all the visuals and all the curriculum for uh, safety training. And uh, Enfold is doing a lot of work in this area, not only for persons with disabilities, but for all young people. They are looking at sexuality and safety training. And the other website that I found really useful, very small, simple website is Arpan. And they have visuals like this, uh, as well as a video and a small book, which says, you know, uh, which is, uh, has the simple things that you can teach your child about sexuality and safety. So these two resources are available for you. If you want to teach them more, yeah. I'm just giving you all a minute to have a look at this. The next part of the curriculum has to be expressing feeling. Now, again, as a, as a community, um, we don't really focus very much on uh, detailed expression of feelings, right? Uh, and uh, we talk about good and bad, and uh, we don't talk about frustration, anxiety. And depression. Now, now I think the younger generation they talk about it a lot more. In our age and generation, at least, it was uh, not really something that uh, you know everybody talked about. This, but it's very important, especially uh, being a teenager, to recognize what is that they are feeling, and express what they are feeling, and know what to do about it. So these three things are very important. What is it that am I am feeling? and express that, you know, my tummy is feeling funny. That is what the child may say. So they, you may, uh, it may be because he has an exam or he has some other test or something coming up and or he, he is not sure whether his friend will play with him. So to recognize, to say that I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling, you know, uh, irritated, I'm feeling frustrated. I have a lot of work to do. So to be able to express that and then to know what to do about it, to give them the skills to make a plan, to deal with those feelings is very important. Yeah. So it's not just about recognizing emotion cards, but to actually uh, be able to understand. And so many of them don't even understand, uh, uh, don't express uh, bodily things like pain or you know stomach uh, internal pain. Uh, so it's important to associate, uh, to teach them to express bodily feelings, to be able to say, I'm feeling cold, I'm feeling hungry, I'm feeling, you know, stomach pain, a headache. So how do you do that? You have to associate the body parts, you're teaching the body parts. So you associate the body parts to a sensation. So you can start at a very young age by, uh, you know, you can put ice, say, on the child's tummy and say, it's cold on my tummy. Then only the child may be able to say, oh, I'm feeling something else inside my tummy. Right? So to associate body parts to sensation is a very important thing which is often ignored in our teaching. And then going into internal, uh, you know, uh, introceptive, as they call it, feelings. And then going into emotions and feelings expression. So 
it's a curriculum that you need to follow and once you're able to express it to express it appropriately like the young man i was talking about to be able to say you know i like you rather than uh, uh, you know say that i want to touch you or i know probably going and touching a person or stalking them on facebook or something like that so they need to know what is the appropriate feeling and uh, appropriate expression of the feeling and inappropriate expression of the feeling they are depending on the uh, person they are talking to and uh, for this uh, one could use lot of techniques uh, which are there in drama like you know role play and uh, uh, rehearsed response which is uh, practicing what they have to say uh, in order to understand and also uh, you know uh, things visuals uh, like the feeling that mom meter to recognize that i am feeling very 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 angry so i need to take a break this is something that is called has to come from the child the child is needing need, needs to learn to what we call regulate themselves and till that point that they are able to regulate themselves we need to be there present with them to co regulate we need to be the person along with them saying oh you are getting into the stage you need to do this also using drama therapy as i said will help to improve their even facial expression understand uh, emotions all very important thing so especially with emotion related training please don't just go with the flash cards or only show them a lot of uh, visuals you can even use movies uh, you can say what is this person feeling if they are interested in movies you know you can teach through the stories that are there in movies or you can uh, create the real situations like how to behave in a restaurant so you can create that situation make it like a role play and uh, you know say what are think of all the things that can happen in a restaurant the person in the table next you have just ordered a pista ice cream but the you the person next to you has ordered a sunday now you feel like having a sunday can you go take it you can't so this kind of thing you need to uh, create situations and role play because they uh, may not otherwise understand they have what they call persons with autism especially have a difficulty understanding the other person's mind so it is important to create situations to make them understand it and there is a curriculum for this also a bit of it they also need to understand the in, uh, boundaries for uh, relationships and intimacy with whom can they do what work, which behavior is appropriate like you know uh, with my private circle my wife or husband then i there is a certain thing that i can do sexually and then there are my own close family and friends i can hug them maybe then there are my you know school mates or office colleague who i can do a handshake and then you know there are persons i just see on the road the watchman or whatever then i just do a wave now handshake is also not good right with corona we have to do number so uh, uh, what is uh, what is a, a strange so to have a definition of all this and have the names there to say these are the people who are strangers these are the people who are in the wave circle handshake circle hug circle so that they explicitly know what is the type of behavior they can do with each person is very important so once all this is done it's also important that we help this person to develop their identity to develop a strong sense of self to be proud of themselves so one thing i talked about is the grooming and dressing and smelling good and you know uh, uh, looking good uh, also you must say that uh, let them know that you know eating a healthy diet and exercise and sleep is going to make them feel very good uh, you know uh, if you have a healthy diet you have less pimples you know if they are worried about their looks they may sort of or if you do exercise you will have a nice strong muscle and uh, the need to sleep uh, many young people uh, especially you know I, i don't know of children on the spectrum usually follow a good routine once it is set but others are not sleeping enough uh, nowadays we are old people young people we are uh, all sleep deprived and that does affect uh, our behavior uh, 
and our uh, attitude. So, uh, so also, uh, this is the age when, you know, uh, it is academically uh, a difficult age. For some of the children, like my son, at this age, uh, it was the age when he could not cope up with the school work anymore. He could not cope up with, you know, all the uh, pressures of middle school. That is when I put him, uh, pulled him out of the school system. For some of them who are academically very good, they are very bright children. This is the age when they have to study a lot more, right? So the academic pressure really increases. And we may tend to focus a lot more on that area. Yeah, and we may ignore all the other areas. It is important for them to have another hobby or an interest or sport so that it helps to de-stress. It is something that will help to bring down the stress. As well as it's an important time for them to learn a lot of life skills. We find a lot, I, I work with young adults who are also placed in mainstream employment. They are very good with their work. They have done very well in their studies, but they do not have the life skills to go and uh, live alone in a new city, for example, and take up a job. So this also has to be parallelly developed. It's important that the life skills and the hobbies and you know the social skills are parallelly developed and in fact more important than even academic skills. I feel there's plenty of time to do the academics, but this is the age where they can actually develop all these things. Yeah, and or when when they have a lot of things to do, they have see they have a hobby. They then can go to their peer and talk to them about their hobby. They can say, look, this is what I learned in my you know uh, sports class today. I did very well. We won a match. They have something to talk about. Yeah, so it is very important that uh, uh, you know uh, they they they. they learn uh, they develop a lot of alternative skills also as well as they learn to complete their routines independently take care of their belongings be responsible for their own safety and you know have their own space at home many many parents come to me and tell me that oh, there are a lot of issues and then they tell me they're still co-sleeping with their child so that is uh, certainly a no-no at some point the child needs to have their own space at home in terms of sleeping so that they can do whatever they want, right? Um, and learn to be alone and even entertain themselves. If we are there with them all the time, then, you know, they may not. See, what happens, especially in autism, is that they may not on their own be able to assert their independence. I have a child, a daughter, who is the typical uh, lead developing person, and I have my son. With her, you know, she asserts her own independence. She asks for her own space. She creates, uh, follows her own hobby, hobbies. But with our children with disability, we may need to do that for them initially. And then, you know, then they understand and they learn to be alone. And uh, as far as the curriculum goes, we've talked about everything, but one more important thing is to be able to say it in a way that the child will, uh, will take it in. Not just uh, hear you, but listen to you and take it in. And I found these, uh, this book very, very useful. The one on the left, how to talk so kids will listen and how to listen so kids will talk. This book changed my life when my son was about six or seven. Till then I was probably at, my pitch was about there. After that, I could talk at, like I'm talking now at this store and get him to at least hear what I'm saying and you know listen to me and make him a more responsible and independent person. And uh, the one on the right uh, is for the teens. But I would always recommend this, reading this uh, kid's book first and then going to the teens because then it will make more sense. And it really helps you to change the way we are talking to our children. Very, very impactful book. Yeah. So uh, we talked about how there are bodily changes, uh, there are sensory changes, which are all related to the hormonal changes, and how it's important to be aware of that, about how it's important to overall be aware of your child's body, the medical conditions he may have, to deal with those medical conditions to overall reduce the stress of the child 
to have this curriculum in order to make the child aware of his uh, changing body and changing emotions and to be able to under make them understand what is socially appropriate and what is not and also to develop a good identity good self image self esteem and to become independent so all these things are important at this age and the other major thing that we face at this age is the challenging behaviors things like you may notice that the child has increased increased stimming he may be non compliant meaning he won't listen to you or having oppositional behavior so if you say one thing they will do just the opposite they may be disrupting you may be trying very hard to do certain things with them but they may be not allowing you to complete that uh, activity or task this child who was your golden child till age 10 at least that that's what happened to my son till 10 years he was quite compliant and quite interested at 11 there was a new person altogether and uh, socially inappropriate behavior having self injury not all of them have but this is also there there's this aggression and destruction of property so these are the common issues that parents share this could be due to anxiety very often anxiety in autism is underrated we don't think that this is child is behaving this way because he himself is scared he himself is worried he himself is anxious whether he is going to do well or he is uh, you know confident about something so this can be caused by lot of high uh, performance demands that we are putting on the child so that could be one reason why they are anxious or due to peer pressure and bullying socially where they have a need especially with children who are higher uh, in the autism higher functioning in the autism spectrum who have to deal with the mainstream school mainstream activities they they may have this need to fit in and a lot of peer pressure also there is a lot of change in the routines and there's a lot of uncertainty even for the typical child i remember my daughter till fifth standard had no exams and then suddenly in sixth standard the curriculum also is very uh, vast and then they have something called exam so she found it very tough uh, that whole period and uh, she had allergies she had uh, broken you know she broke her bone so these thing happened to the typical child and obviously it uh, can happen to the child with disability and in their case their coping skills are a little more uh, you know poor and so they may feel uh, very anxious at this stage they may have life transitions that can also trigger a lot of anxiety they could be divorce or a sibling older sibling going off to college or something like that you know or a death of a grandparent uh, can uh, sort of make it go bad for them because for them it, that person being in the house is is you know is a norm and they're not able to uh, understand the change it did happen you know even to my son recently when my daughter moved out to college he was anxious for a period of 3 months but in this time i was very much prepared i knew that he is very emotionally attached is that kind of a person so we had to work on his anxiety in a very uh, caring and understanding way he, a lot of stimming came back for 3 months uh, till he got adjusted to the fact that his sister no longer is going to be at home Uh, of course now with corona she's back with us and he's quite happy and so we may have to go through the transition again yeah so it can cause a lot of anxiety so the general strategies are similar i'm not going to go through behavior management here uh, so uh, one needs to look at whether the child has a open communication channel with you they are able to come up to you are they able to initiate communication my son is non verbal but he can come and tell me that i uh, you know i'm feeling anxious or i'm feeling stomach pain or i you know i want to take a break can your child tell you that it's very important one is is he able to say that so if he's not able to say that verbally what are the adaptations or tools that you can give the child in order to communicate and are you open enough to listen to these things are you going to say no 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 you, i you're not anxious you've got to finish this or are you going to be a listener so that book that i talked about is going to help you to build that open communication channel with the child the how to talk to kids 
The other thing is to uh, try and see whether the child is not understanding this context. You know, uh, in school, what is the context? In at home, what is the context? The girls, when they behave, what is the context? So to teach those skills, the social skills through social stories, video modeling, role play, as I said, is this causing the behavior? That not understanding the rules. So one needs to analyze that. The next thing is to look at whether we are trespassing the child's need for independence, because this is the period when they are trying to become more and more independent, but if we are still controlling everything and we are not giving them choice, we are not giving them privacy, and we are not giving them responsibility. Very important to give them responsibilities because then they have a sense of achievement. Yeah, even if they cannot be successful in studies or something, if you can give them you know responsibilities at home, they feel good. Yeah. So uh, it is very important to see whether these aspects are there. And if they are unable to control themselves or regulate themselves, uh, you know, you have to support them using, you know, some visual cues. Uh, and also something called co-regulation, where you are with the child as a partner, not as a person who is controlling the behavior. So to use a language like we, we are going to try to calm down, we are going to try to complete this task. Very important to use co-regulation there, right? So these are the general strategies, yeah? And in spite of these strategies, the child may get into a lot of anger and frustration, something bodily may be troubling them. And uh, uh, it is important that you can, you should be able to talk to them and uh, you need to be very calm. The co-regulation bit is very important because, you know, you need, when you are calm, it sort of helps them to, to be calm, to come to you. If you're also going to be at a high level, the child is also at a high level, then both of you have to calm down. This is going to take longer. So if the child is somewhere here and you can be calm, then he can sort of use your calmness to calm down. So it's a very important thing. So if you are getting frustrated, you're getting angry, which is normal. I'm not saying as a parent or as a teacher, we are also humans. We get frustrated, we get angry. It is very important that we have coping strategies with, for all that. We take help. If we, if we are not able to do that, we take help or we learn to have some tools. I have to rehearse my voice because as soon as I said no in the louder pitch, my son used to be triggered. So I had to rehearse not to use the word no and to have alternate ways of saying it and to be very calm when I'm talking to him. It was something I had to rehearse and that really helped him to regulate himself. And now he uh, is able to regulate himself. So it's very important. Uh, and to later on to analyze the behavior, maybe at that point, if you tell them what is right and wrong, it may not get into their head. So later on to sort of tell them that this is what happened and to have a debrief and what they could have done differently and to practice that, to rehearse what they could have done differently. Then over time, it may become a habit. And uh, one advice is not to engage in power struggle. It will only make the situation worse. If you're going to say, no, I when the child is saying this, you're also wanting to have your way. It's not very important to look at safety of yourself and others. So in case a child is becoming aggressive or destructive, uh, there is certain protocol that I'm going to share. It is very important to move the child away to a safe place and not to engage till they calm down. It's very important. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's also important to practice how, what are the calming techniques. So whether it's breathing or whatever, whether it's you know, going to a calm area. To keep on practicing it even when they are not um, agitated. I'm it sorry, Akila, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but I think there's a lot of background noise coming from your end. It is? Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. 
yeah uh, hopefully it will be better from now yeah 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 it's much better thank you yeah yeah all right so uh do i need to go back a few slides was it audible earlier no no i think it's okay you can just continue from where right. okay so it's very important to practice these coping skills when the child is calm and to this is like a poster it's a it's again a free resource which is available uh, to which you can put on the wall so that it, it serves as a visual cue what they can do when they're feeling really they're going to you know get agitated they can ask for a break and do any of these so that they can regulate themselves and it's very important to respect their need for a break of course many of them may use that as a uh, thing to escape the activity and you as a teacher or a parent need to know when they are trying to use that to escape activity and when it is really because they have stress and to make the judgment but it is important and it's important for them also to recognize that they are getting into what they call the red zone uh, where they have to stop and take a break and then come back to the activity red zone is when they are really angry hitting yelling or uh, the yellow zone is when they are you know hyper or frustrated and to tell them that you need to come into the green zone where you're happy and okay and ready to learn the blue zone is usually the where they're very tired or sick and they again they're not able to focus and uh, down there are the tools they can get into the green zone by doing these activities so you need to find out what works for your child to calm down so uh, there are tools uh, that can help them to become more alert and there are tools to make them more uh, get them to calm down more bill lates and i have not put it up but he has a lot of tools uh, to understand this about sensory regulation and uh, managing you know behaviors through that so they need to know yeah so uh, for us what we need to understand is what is happening in a meltdown in when the child everything breaks down so there are two sides to the brain right the frontal lobes as i said are the seat of the executive function which tells us what is right and wrong and how we, you know it helps us to control ourselves to you know uh, delay satiation for example if i am told that i if i do all this i'll get a reward to be able to wait and do that so that takes some amount of self control so all this comes from the uh, the decision making comes from the executive function but on the other side the other part of the brain is the uh, is the right side of the brain which uh, has a lot of uh, is the seat of the emotions the amygdala and that uh, tells you that this is what i like this is what i prefer i want this and also it is a seat where you have things you have done from childhood you've done it this way it's a habit it's a routine yeah so i remember as a young child my grandmother used to tell me you have to wash your hands and feet before you come and i always questioned her and she was a child who was born 100 years ago when they had the spanish flu so now i understand with corona why i have to wash my hands and like before i come into the house but she it was a habit right and so if somebody didn't follow that habit or didn't do the choice when i'm already in a state of you know irritation there are some other triggers then the balance goes off and it goes into a meltdown it could be the trigger could be uh, an emotional trigger it could be a sensory trigger it could be just that you are not too well it could be a physical overload it could be a change in the habit or the routine that they are used to so any of this can be the trigger yeah and usually you can uh, sort of uh, guess that they are that the anger is building because certain behaviors will increase uh, you know whistling will increase flapping will increase rocking may increase tapping maybe some noises they make uh, a mumbling change of you know tone uh, or they may be swearing or making a threat uh, you know all these kind of things are are the signs that we call as a rumbling stage and if you are able to decode this and the child is even able to decode this eventually he needs to know i'm getting into that state where i might have a outburst so i need to do something then you you teach them certain strategies which is in the 
you know, the coping strategies I talked about here. So you teach them those things, the schedule, a structure they need to follow. If they are getting into that stage, take a break, go to the timeout zone, do these things and come back. So if they or you are able to at this stage, then the meltdown may not occur. So it's very important to understand the rumbling stage in order to prevent the meltdown. Initially, the parent or the teacher needs to understand it and later on, we need to pass on this understanding to the child himself or herself so that they understand it and start initiating the uh, redirection of their uh, feelings. But if it goes past that stage, then the balance goes out of balance. Then if they go into the stage where there is the screaming or uh, aggressive behavior like hitting, kicking and biting or self-injury or head, biting themselves or head banging, all this kind of thing. That is called the rage stage. Now, once they go into the rage stage, you cannot do much. Yeah. So what, what you need to do is to move away from the front of the child. First of all, you need to be safe yourself. Yeah, it's like the oxygen mask they say in the plane. To first move away child and face. Usually we go behind the child. Don't give eye contact. Don't stare at them and say, how come you're getting into the stage? No, that will make it worse. Be very respectful. If need be, hold them from the back. Yeah, and if you cannot hold them alone, call for help. Two people hold and seat the person. Make them sit down or move them to their room or some area in the school or center where there's the calming zone so that they can calm down. So that is all you have to do. You don't have to speak anything. You shouldn't give eye contact. So once they get into the rage stage, the important thing is to follow the plan, how you're going to deal with them and move them to the cooling zone and let them recover. In the uh, recovery stage, we can give them play some music, and you know, allow them to uh, play with their iPad or their toys or whatever. Again, it depends on each child. They may cry, they may sleep. Uh, many of them are not able to even, you know, remember that they went into a rage, or they may be very apologetic, or they may smile. At that point, it is important to be very matter of fact. Don't give in to all. If they apologize, you said, yeah, yeah, okay. You don't like over uh, the thing, empathize with them, nor are you unsympathetic. So it's important to just be calm or cool and then uh, redirect them to some uh, calming activity that already, you know, is uh, good for them and then bring them back to the learning time. So this is the typical way to deal with the meltdown or the rage. Yeah. So in order to go through this difficult period with our children, uh, we have to remember that change is inevitable. We can't avoid it. Every child is going to go through puberty and we have, there is going to be changes in the child. Very rarely, very rarely, they, I do have seen children who really, it's a positive change also. So they do very well in puberty. All, you know, they, they may have been a very problematic kid till then and then in puberty suddenly they change for the good. But that is rare. Most of us have very a uh, difficult phase in puberty, and uh, it's very important to have the curriculum as a structured way of approaching it. It's very necessary, but it's not sufficient. Our attitude also matters, uh, you know, in terms of letting the child have a choice to let them become independent, to have a plan for their own, uh, you know, future and self-esteem and self-actualization. The problem is happening to them, not to us. We are there to facilitate them, to go through it, to come out of it victorious. That is, if we take up that kind of an attitude, then it will be easier. There will be challenges along the way, challenges normal, but care and connection with your child certainly will help. Yeah. So this is uh, what is called the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is used in management, but for anybody. These are the base hierarchy of needs. First, it is the basic needs need to be covered. They need to have, they need to feel safe. They need to feel accepted. 
and as this is, these are again Bill Nace and I really like him, so I'm going to quote from him and he says, you make the child feel safe, accepted and competent. So they, they also need to feel competent, uh, doing something, uh, you know, which is of value, which uh, is according to their abilities and interests. All this put together, then for sure they will come out of this space as a very, uh, you know, sure, confident individual who is useful to themselves, first of all, and to their family and the community. So uh, we cannot use the usual way, the usual academic sort of career planning with our children because our children are, you know, across the spectrum. They're very different. Even within the autism spectrum, two children are not alike. But many of them have a lot of uh, skills. Many have music, art, uh, you know, memory, uh, poetry skills. So try, if the regular way of education is not working, then use alternative way of education. At Amaze, uh, we are using things like technology and arts, as well as nature. Many of them are doing very well in a farm setup. Some of them are working in a farm. So you have to think creatively as to what is it that a child is interested in, what are their abilities, and match it. Look at the sensory differences as a way of entering their world and uh, you know uh, have a person centric approach don't use the one size fits all approach especially in autism it doesn't work uh, i just have uh, very limited interns 15 of them but uh, four are interested in cooking four are doing content development three are doing farming one is into music so just see the you know i can't have one curriculum for all of them so your child is very unique and uh, every child is unique, uh, but uh, in, uh, please look at it from their, you know, their learning style, their abilities and interests and to focus on life skills communication and uh, I would use the term literacy versus academic. They need to read and write, they need to be have digital literacy uh, in these times. That's very important, but uh, you know, uh, that is certainly more important than just academic knowledge which is very good if they're able to cope up with academics i have nothing against it but many of us are following that uh, academic path for far too long and ignoring all the other aspects and to look at it uh, you know from a very practical uh, life span kind of approach that's what we're doing at amaze so i just wanted to share and yeah uh, i'm done uh, i'm open for questions Great, thank you so much, Akila. That was a lot of ground you covered. Um, that's that's a lot uh, to take, um, definitely. So, uh, so a lot of you have been texting me uh, on the side. Yes, this presentation will be made available to you. I know it's a lot of information, uh, so you will have access to it. So, first and uh, you know, uh, uh, put some thought into it. And the recording of this webinar will also be made available to you. So you're going to have the chance to listen to this all over again for sure. So don't worry about that. Um, okay, Akila, we'll just uh, we'll let you catch your breath for five ten minutes too. Uh, um, Ashwarya, can you do the honors? Yeah, I sent already Hello. sent it on the chat. Yeah. Okay. So Ashwarya sent you a feedback form. It's a Google form. It up. Uh, it, it's just going to take, it'll actually just take five minutes at a time. So please go ahead and fill it up for us. There's a consent, uh, qu there's a question asking for your consent if we can post this. So please, uh, which is why we would really like all of you to uh, please fill the form uh, right now. And uh, we will try. And Akira, how much time do you have on your hands? Because I see there are quite a few questions here. I'm okay. I'm okay to go on. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, so we will be, so as soon after you finish the feedback form, um, we will uh, be taking the questions in the order in which they have been asked. Uh, some of you have given us a very descriptive question. Uh, in that case, we will unmute you and you can please go ahead and elaborate and put it into context for Akila. 
um, and when you do so, yeah, feel free to put your video on. It would be great to see you as well in the process. So, okay. So let's take a quick five minute break for you to fill the form. Akhila, what about the questions? I see, uh, I see a lot of the questions have been uh, addressed in the PPT uh, because the parent here who had posted it had asked us, you know, shall I post all the questions again? But I, I think you have covered it in that context is what I would think, unless uh, if you, uh, um, I mean, I can yeah. just go through those questions that were uh, sent and uh, okay. uh, while they are filling up the form, okay? And answer sure. whatever has not been answered. Is that okay? Sure, sure, sure. Do you have quick access to it or do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, I have it open. I have it open. Okay, super. Okay. So, so uh, Raja Lakshmi, I think it was you who had shared the question. Are you around? I'm just trying to find you. Or was it Rajeshwari? I'm sorry. I'm Rajeshwari. Rajeshwari. It was Rajeshwari, yes. Rajeshwari, I can see you here. So um, while people are filling uh, the feedback form, uh, Akhila is going to go over all the questions. So if there's something that's missed, she'll address it right now. So I hope you're listening. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. So the uh, Raji had sent a few questions. I know Raji very well. Uh, and I think it's a compilation of questions of various parents. So the first okay. one was how uh, to how to go about teaching sexuality to our kids, which I, I think I sort of gave pointers to. So uh, that I'm not going to answer. The second question was how to differentiate whether the behavior is sensory or sexual. Now, uh, sexual uh, feelings are sensory feelings. Usually, as I said, you know, and the, the tactile system gets activated during puberty because uh, the sexual, the skin is one of the sex organs that we have. So uh, it may not be easy to, uh, you know, find out, but uh, we need to just deal with it as saying this is appropriate, not appropriate, this is private, this is public, that kind of thing. There is no, I mean, there's no need to sort of go technical and say is it sensory, is it sexual. Uh, the third thing is strenuous physical activities, uh, do they suppress sexual feelings? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I think uh, it's just a myth that if you make, you know, even, even with hyperactivity, I feel that just making them do a lot of physical activity is not to reduce the hyperactivity to that large extent. It might make them a little tired and sit down, but overall we are still not looking at the root cause of the problem. We could, you know, similar to that, I think, uh, no, uh, you know, sexual feelings are very different from the physical, uh, you know, uh, energy that we have. And uh, the physical energy, expending it will not reduce the sexual feelings. Uh, how to educate the kids about touching their private parts before <laughs> others is not a healthy behavior. As I said, we may need to use tools, uh, you know, your understanding of private and public. Now, these two words became very important, you know, for us. We use it all the time. Uh, so you should be able, as soon as a child uh, is uh, engaging, you should be able to tell the child, this is a public space. Uh, you are in the classroom or you are in the mall or you're... These are, this is a public space and hence you cannot do this. What you're doing is a private behavior. You can do it once you get home. That is what you would have to say for which you have to go through the curriculum training where they learn about uh, private parts, public parts, private activity, public activity, private is a public space. They need to understand these words in a very practical way. Then is it an appropriate age to talk about sexuality uh, to our kids? Example, for my son, uh, he asked, what is family planning after seeing a serial? Uh, yeah, I mean, when the child is asking a question, I think we should give an answer in a way that the child understands. Like, I remember uh, my daughter asking me about uh, pads because she saw uh, advertisement and uh, she was just four or five years old. So she said, what is this menstrual pad? And why are they putting blue ink and red ink on it and all that? So I said, I had to tell her at that point that women do have some, uh, you know, sort of eggs. And then every once in a month, if the egg doesn't become a baby, it comes out 
from wherever you pass urine, it comes out and it is, you know, red in color. And uh, so one needs to wear, like you wear a diaper, you need to wear a pad. So very practical way, because she asked me the question, I gave her an answer. So there's no right and wrong age. If the child is curious about family planning, you can say that, you know, uh, uh, family planning is a way where you take a medicine or something. So that you just have one baby or two babies and you don't have too many babies. You know, it's okay to just give a very simple explanation to them. Raji, is that good enough or you have any follow-up on that? Shall I go ahead? Let me try and unmute her. Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to, yes. Yes, Rajeshwari, I have unmuted you. Yeah, yeah. If you would like, yeah. yeah. Till now, did I answer some of your questions or you have? No, sure. These are the compilation of some of the questions asked by a lot of parents who are here. Yeah. Sorry, oh. we can't hear you so well. Hello. Yeah. Are you able to hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Yeah. See, so these are the compilation of some of the questions of the parents, some of them who are attending here. So, yes, Akila, it does answer our questions. Please okay. go ahead. Thank okay. you. Then um, uh, the fifth question was, uh, should I start talking about infatuation and love to my teenager or wait till he shows some signs of it? Uh, I think we can talk about love. I mean, love is a universal term. We love our parents. We love our sisters. So, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, when you're talking about physical attraction to somebody, uh, if, if that is the question, yeah, you could, uh, you know, sort of uh, let them know that sometimes you feel uh, more, uh, you know, uh, you're like a fan of that person. You really want to go get close to them. And that is what is called, uh, you know, having a crush or infatuation. And you can share how you had a crush. Like I had a crush on Imran Khan and I now don't have a crush on him anymore. So, you know, it is something that is a passing phase. You could uh, talk about it, uh, but uh, don't just make a big deal of it. You know, that's the more uh, important thing. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Then the sixth question was, how do I make my child more aware of many changes in his body during adolescence and how to teach him uh, to go and uh, conduct himself publicly. I think that was answered in the presentation. Yeah. Seventh question is, how do I educate my child about maintaining arms length from everybody, especially the opposite sex, being naturally affectionate, wants to hug everyone. Uh, while we give the list of who he can hug and not, is it not confusing when his sibling who's younger is hugged by others? He also sees me hugging my friends especially after meeting a lot of them. So this is where you use that circles of, you know, relationship and intimacy. And you tell them who is, uh, can be hugged by them, who cannot be hugged and why. And also the social story about the personal space maybe can be used. Uh, I think that was there in the slide, an example of how to teach that. And uh, also talk to them about consent, you know, talk to them that other person may not really want to be touched. They have a preference. So you have to ask them before you hug them. Can I hug you? You know, are you okay? You know, I uh, personally, even I had an issue with it. I am a person who is very cuddly and hug everyone. So I had to learn who I can hug and who I should not hug. It's something I had to learn, I remember as a child. So uh, it's important. that, uh, And if the youngest sibling is being uh, hugged, by others, it's a you know, it's important that that you know, just for the sake of this child, uh, to also respect that you know, uh, maybe you can request people not to physically uh, sort of uh, you know, hug and kiss. Uh, it is very confusing. Uh, I remember, um, I think till till the time uh, my daughter was six or seven, and my son is five years older than her. So she used to literally go jump on him and, you know, play with him. And I had to uh, teach her also that it is inappropriate to uh, hug. And she was just five or six, but because my son is already 11 or 12, 
I had to teach uh, her to ma maintain that distance from her, from him. Yeah, and I had to just tell her in a very simple way that if you, uh, you know, uh, jump on him, uh, then he gets very excited and he may do things that are not very, you know, appropriate. And so you both need to not hug where the frontal part of the body touch. You can hug from, you know, standing shoulders. So they actually, both of them, I had to train how, what kind of hugging is okay. And all of us in the house so would only engage in that kind of hugging where only till the shoulders touch and the rest of the body is away. And uh, kissing also only on the cheek and not on any other part or the forehead. So even uh, after all that training, even today, uh, Nishu will kiss her only on the forehead. So it's something that came with a lot of training. Yeah. Then uh, what should I uh, exactly say or do when I find my son uh, in bed uh, with his hands in a private part? I think I would say close the door. So yeah, uh, that's what uh, you need to say if the child is engaging in masturbation. Then you leave the room and then you ensure they know what to do, you know, uh, later on to clean up or, you know, whatever. That is all you need to do. Yeah. Uh, and next time, knock the door. Yeah. So then, um, what age should we talk about or teach masturbation? Uh, yeah. This is something uh, I get asked a lot. So I, I think there's no age to it. If the child is engaging in it, some of our children, very young children, also have a thing of touching, you know, their private part because it is uh, something that may be giving pleasurable feelings even from the pre-pubertal ages. So at that point, one could, uh, you know, discourage that kind of thing uh, because uh, from, you know, and redirect it to what it could just be a need to squeeze something or whatever. So that could be redirected. But if the child is at a pubertal age and is uh, engaging in uh, masturbation, then it's important to start talking to them about it and teaching them. Uh, uh, if there is a frustration because they're not able to release themselves, uh, that can be a problematic thing. So if you see that frustration, then it's important that a male member teaches them how to masturbate so at that time. It could be at age 12, it could be at 16, it could be at 20. Some kids may not have the need for it at all. So, uh, you know, it depends. If you see the frustration because they are not able to know the technique to masturbate properly in a way that it reaches, you know, orgasm or release, then we may need to teach them. Yeah. Then what do we say or do when uh, all of a sudden, there's a graphic making out scene on the screen. Nothing. I would, I would just say nothing. Yeah, let them ask the question. Let them just uh, absorb it. Over the minute we react, you know, you know, our kids love attention seeking behavior, and then that itself can become it. So I wouldn't say anything. In spite of being told that mouth is a private part, my son continues to ask if he can kiss. As a good opportunity when either of his parents are close to his face, he attempts it. I don't want to discourage the thought or tell him it's wrong. How do I direct his attention to the right person? Do I teach him to identify girlfriend? No, I don't think you need to talk that you can kiss your girlfriend now. Unless, you know, he's much older. First of all, we would just say that you don't kiss me. I'm your mother and he's uh, your father. We do not kiss me on the lips. You can kiss me on my forehead. So keep redirecting them to where they can kiss. Yeah. And uh, also, you know, if he's much older and he's showing interest in, you know, kissing a female or something like that, uh, then you can talk about, uh, you know, that much later. And uh, for a child who's struggling to express himself, is not uh, non-verbal, where do I start? Uh, he has turned 12 
and high time I expose him to this facet of life, I'm left wondering if it will make sense to him. So when there are instances when he exhibits some inappropriate behavior, all we do is distract him or explain he you need to go to a private place. I think he's ready for the entire curriculum. You need to talk to him about his body parts, how his body is changing, how his emotions are changing, how his brain is changing, what is expected of him, what are the rules, what is private part. So this is the right age to start the curriculum. And it will take six months to one year to understand this whole career, you know, whole gambit of things. There will be a lot of mistakes. There will be a lot of uh, embarrassing things for him and for you. But take them as teaching opportunities and, uh, you know, keep teaching, keep redirecting in a calm and uh, uh, practical way. And I'm sure he will get it over time. He's only 12. So, yeah, if he gets it by 15, 16, that's great. Many of us don't get it even at this age. Yeah. Dealing with sexuality, most of the time, uh, it is to set rules and make them follow. How and what are the ways to implement these rules? Rules, uh, rules are uh, followed when we uh, we follow up, right? We wear a helmet if we see a cop. We <laughs> don't wear a helmet otherwise. So uh, we've got to sort of enforce these rules in every situation, be consistent. Uh, teach them the exceptions to the rules and uh, have consequences if they don't feel, uh, you know, uh, don't sort of follow the rules. So these are the ways to implement the rules. There's no special new way. And to also in our children's case, maybe having uh, reminders or visuals or reviews of the areas that they're feeling difficult to understand, often enough will help. Uh, I'm on to the 14th question. How do we explain private time and socially appropriate behavior? I think we've talked about that quite a lot. Safe and unsafe touch. It's similar as private and public, but where you teach what are the areas that are safe, safe to touch, uh, safe for others to touch, and what are the exceptions? Like you'll have to teach exceptions that maybe, you know, parents or doctor may have to touch or see. Sometimes, you know, there's a problem in that area that also one needs to teach. Uh, otherwise, it's just like any other curriculum as well. It, the curriculum on the tabletop and then practically creating situations uh, so that they can practice their skill through role play, through drama. All this is what is going to happen. How to teach a child? Uh, with concerns about private parts, menstrual cycles, uh, smells, accidents are not to be broadcasted. While repetition that he or she comes and tells me is constantly the fear that it is being said to peers in the opposite sex or publicly, or peer, peers who may tease or ridicule. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a serious issue if the child is not uh, knowing what to say and whom to say. So that again, um, you know, just having maybe even some cue cards of uh, just holding themselves back uh, may help. Uh, role play may help. Uh, depends on the child, really. Um, if they really feel that they need to say, maybe they can have a small diary where they write it down. And later on, when they come home, they can tell you about it. Because they may have the need to share it immediately. And at that point, they may just be the friend or someone with them. So it is important to tell them that these kind of things we don't share with everyone, only with the best friend or with the teacher or with me. And so can you, you know, if you really need to tell it urgently, can you request the teacher that you need to call me or write it down? So you need to have a strategy that they will follow. The words boyfriend and girlfriend seem to be in the vocabulary used by the peer group. Does one even try to explain the relationship or not? If it is there in the peer group, yes, one needs to explain to them about uh, relationship, about uh, you know uh, somebody being more special than the others, and uh, you know wh what it means. 
certainly important. And uh, I, ha I do remember, I would like to share one of the adults with autism who I know, uh, and he calls me up and he's constantly confused why uh, everybody has a boyfriend or girlfriend and uh, he's, he's quite old in the sense he's 27 or 28 and nobody seems to want to be his girlfriend and he's quite upset with that. So they are aware of these feelings and they do want and he, he also discusses reasons. He says, is it because, you know, I, I'm, uh, I don't have barriers like caste or, you know, color or, uh, you know, even class. I'm ready to be a boyfriend to even a shop girl or a poor girl, but nobody seems to be interested in me. He discusses these things and I think it's important. Yes, we talk about these things because they do have real feelings and, uh, Unless they can talk about these feelings, they may uh, end up being anxious or depressed about these things. How do we facilitate a healthy and congenial meeting, spending time with peers of opposite sex? Uh, uh, this is a million dollar question. There are people who are working on it. They are working on dating apps and working on the relationship space. Uh, you know, uh, to find people who are interested in meeting or spending time. But I think if we can create interesting activities, you know, uh, which uh, which both sexes in are, how did we meet, you know, uh, our boyfriends or girlfriends or husbands? Or, we all met them when we were doing some activities that we mutually liked or, you know, had a common interest. So, that is one way to develop a lot of interests and uh, inclusive activities where both genders are involved. Uh, India, even for uh, uh, typical kids uh, uh, using dating apps and stuff like that, it's only now getting popular. And there's also a safety aspect to it. So I don't have a, you know, a, uh, hundred percent answer to this, but it is a need. You know, we need to create some things. You know, there is a couple of people who are doing work in this area. Then, how do we make them understand about abuse? Yes, we need to make them understand that abuse is something that happens when you don't like it, you're not comfortable, and people are uh, touching you in a way that is unsafe. And they need, as I said, to be able to say no. It's a very important skill to be able to make a choice to say no in order to have a defense against abuse. And they need to be able to come and report abuse. Yeah, so having the uh, open communication channel is very important. Um, we, very often we don't want our child to be, you know, aggressive or shout, but I think, uh, uh, some amount of uh, assertiveness is very important to protect uh, themselves uh, against abuse. My son tries to touch his younger brother's private part. What should I do at that time? Obviously, you have to say no, that uh, you don't touch uh, the private areas of others. Uh, it's a big no-no. And uh, maybe redirect him to some other, you know, activity. You can analyze why he's trying to do that. Is it just curiosity? Is it that he wants some sensory feeling out of squeezing something and you can give an alternate toy? Uh, I would need to understand that, uh, that particular situation to be able to. Uh, that it's a no-no. Yeah, I think the 20 questions I've gone through quite exhausted. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, I think this is a good... Um, I, I'm wondering uh, if you would have time. I mean, I think you would also be tired. Would you be... Uh, because there are quite a few questions that have come up here. Okay. Um, what do you recommend I do? Can I sift through it and send them out to you so you have some time to sort of look at it rather than go over all of them right now? I leave it up entirely up to you because... They seem pretty different. Um, one, two, quite a, well, not that much actually. Um, Ashura, maybe I believe, we can, you 
maybe we can go on till about 5:30 and then uh, the and rest then, of uh, them, we, yeah we okay. can just sort of i don't know okay. whether i'll have the time to get back on email and all that i'm not very sure Right, right. No, it will also give me a chance to look at it to see if you have already addressed it during the course of this. Mm -hmm. So then I won't send those to you. Yeah, I, yeah, and, yeah. Um, Okay, maybe we can start here. Ashwarya, do we know where the first question is? I'm trying to... Yeah, the first question is from Janice Philip. Nocturnal emissions. How do we explain this as teachers in class? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is a normal thing to have nocturnal... It's just, just like toilet training you need to make them aware that this kind of thing is going to happen and you may need to have a towel next to you or you may need to get up yeah. and go look, and wash look. yourself something like that very practical training uh, okay um the next question is my son is 10 years old uh, he is intelligent but non-verbal he sometimes rubs his private parts against the bed is he getting an erection? How to explain it to him? It is also embarrassing if he goes like this during a social gathering. Uh, yeah, so uh, they may not directly get an erection, but they may uh, feel uh, pleasurable, that kind of activity, just the beginning of trying to masturbate. So it's important that they learn that this is a private activity and they, uh, you know, they do it only in a particular place. So you might want to uh, get him used to, a, you know, a particular pillow or something so that he is not doing it with every bed and every pillow that he goes to. So you say, this is your rubbing pillow or something like that. So that, you know, he restricts it to that pillow, which is only in his room, bedroom on his bed. You know, something like that might work. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, the next question is, my son is, Ishan is 10 years old and he's on the verge of adolescence. Uh, one in issue that concerns me is that he's very t ticklish and even seems to seeking the ticklish pleasure sensation. He always wants people to tickle him, preferably with their noses or he himself undresses underarms on their noses so that he gets a ticklish sensation. Um, even otherwise, he seems to be more attracted towards girls rather than boys. If they are elaborate gowns kind of dresses, he immediately runs after them. As I'm a teacher living in a residential campus, everybody knows him and no major problem has happened, but I'm still apprehensive how people will react once he's an adult. Yeah, so this ticklishness, as I said, is when the, the skin system is changing uh, and uh, there is a, you know, uh, for sexual, so massages, deep massages may help. Basically, if you do more of deep massages, it may reduce the ticklishness. Yeah, that is one thing. And the second thing is to, the social skills training has to happen. Uh, where you say that, you know, yeah, you may like, you know, so and so to be your friend, you may really like them, but they may not want you to run behind them, to chase them. And you may need to role play and you may need to say that if you keep, you know, chasing them, they may not want to really be your friend. They may not want to play with you. So you need to maintain the distance. And so make it, you know, in a way that is positive for the child. Oh, that, okay. you know, they learn. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the next question, Akhil, I think you already addressed it. It's my son is getting phys physically attracted to me. How to deal with this? I think you did talk about it, right? A bit. Yeah. So if they're getting attracted uh, to you, then again, yeah, you just say that these, I don't feel comfortable if you touch and you actually physically block them and say that, no, you, I don't feel comfortable. Don't touch me. Um, the next question. Chest. Um, is from Shanmuga Priya. Uh, my son masturbates in prone position in his bedroom. Should I teach him to do it in standing position in the restroom? Uh, not really. You don't need to teach. They learn it on their own according to me. And yeah, I, I don't think uh, one needs to really go in detail and teach the act of masturbation in such detail unless there is a need, as I said. If they are not getting frustrated because they don't have a release, 
then uh, you may need to teach them how to get the release, whether it's in the bed or in the toilet. Um, um, the next question, I think, again, you addressed it, which was uh, how, how my son is 16 years old, how to make him express his feelings appropriately towards the opposite sex. He tends to touch his private parts when he's angry. And how do I know if he's being sexually abused? How do you know? If he's being it's written, how do we know if they are sexually abused? So unless, first of all, uh, the child needs to be able to communicate to you. And then he needs to know which is appropriate and inappropriate behavior and what is abuse. Then only they will be able to communicate to you that such a thing has happened, something wrong has happened. Yeah. Uh, so uh, all that training has to happen. And then I'm sure, you know, it takes about a year, six months to a year. It's not like a magic pill for them to, you know, they won't overnight be able to tell you, but assertiveness training is important. As I said, for abuse, communication is important. Knowing what is safe and unsafe is important. Then they'll be able to tell you. Um, the other question is, um, some adolescents in our group have seizures, so the parents are apprehensive about letting them sleep separately. So even now they sleep with their parents. Please advise. Okay, so uh, uh, one could always, like, you know, now there is technology, so you could always have a monitor in the child's room. You know, that's uh, the technology that the best they use from right from when the child is uh, born. They are in a nursery and you're monitoring the child. That could be one solution. And if you do need to sleep with the child, then at least have a separate bed. See, there may be times when the child is sick or you may have restrictions of space in your room and all that. So then you need to at least have a separate bed for the child. You're not physically sleeping close to the child. There is something between you all, like a bolster at least. And uh, also have some times of the day when the child has a room to themselves. So they can engage in whatever they want to do. So that's important. Um, the next question is, what is an appropriate, appropriate age to start making kids sleep separately? Um, I would say five, five or six years old. Yeah. Once they're able to, they toilet train and, you know, they're independent with certain basic ADL, then I would uh, start training them. They may take some time. They may take up to five, six, seven, eight years old by the time they learn to sleep separately. And this is not a feature of uh, disability or being non-disabled. My son learned, I think, quicker. He likes his independence to sleep on his own. My daughter is 19. She still wants somebody with her half the time. So not that she can't. She lives in a hostel and all that. But, you know, she's more comfortable sharing the room with someone. So, yeah. Uh, it's nice. Um, another question is how to identify depression in teens? How to identify? Depression and teens. So uh, the, the, the regular, uh, you know, uh, symptoms of depression uh, may be uh, what you need to look out for, where they don't show interest in activities, uh, they are not able to sleep or eat properly. Um, uh, you know, those are the major symptoms. Uh, they're not performing up to the level. There is a change in the performance level academically. Uh, they are not interacting maybe even with their peers. They're not engaging in even in things that they are interested in before. These are the symptoms of depression. Okay. Um, the next question is, my son is eight years old and he's non-verbal. He's been doing masturbation from four years of age. Why is, is that and how do I handle it? Uh, yeah, as I said, some uh, children, you know, uh, uh, do engage in rubbing their penis on some surface, whether it's the bed, uh, pillow on the bed, or even several things. Like uh, yeah, I went through it even with my son, where he would rub against the corner of the wall and stuff like that. It gives them some tactile feedback, and they're not able to, 
because it gives an intense feedback. It's something they engage in again. So uh, it is important uh, uh, to keep teaching them that it is inappropriate to do it in a public space. That that has to be reinforced uh, then from a younger age for this sort of a child without maybe going into the sexual details. That uh, just like you say, you no, know, don't put your hand in your nose or something like that. Similar to that, you will say no hand in the pan or no rubbing in public. This is public, you know. Just uh, need to keep at it uh, without getting into the graphic details of the sexual sexuality. Okay. Um. The next question is one of my friend's daughters, who is twenty-two years old, was autistic, and later in her adolescence, she had bipolar with extreme addict um aggression. How can we know that the child is shifting towards bipolar disorder in his teens? Bipolar is usually uh, characterized uh, characterized by uh, having uh, phases, you know, mood phases or sort of. Uh, I would say they have two states, <laughs> if, uh, for a lack of uh, simpler explanation. Where in one in which they are very friendly, they are very uh, compliant and all that. And then they uh, suddenly switch and go into so that is how bipolar is uh, presenting. It will present with one state where they are very uh, typical and nothing seems to be wrong with them. Very compliant, very easy to manage, and then suddenly they become explosive. They also can tend to then be you know have wandering, you know various other things. So if there is a switch between these two, then you know. You can uh, say that they have bipolar. It uh, it is not uh, related uh, directly to autism. Even typically developing teens can have bipolar disorder. So, but it could be comorbid with autism. Uh, being having autism doesn't exclude uh, depression or bipolar or uh, those kind of disorders can come along with autism, which makes it a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question uh, is, um, my son is 7.5 years old and he's on the spectrum. He's just recently started to lie on his stomach and started to rub his penis. Need to know how to deal with this, please. How do I teach him the correct way? He isn't using his hands yet. He's rubbing it by being on his tummy. I'm even confused if this is an early sign or not. Should I distract him? Because if I do, he gets angry. Um, he tends to masturbate lesser if I keep him engaged all day. He does it in the living room and doesn't abide when I try to shift him to the bedroom. Though he's 7.5, he's strong physically and I'm unable to drag him in. How do I handle this? Is the washroom a choice or how do I do this? Um, yeah, so at 7.5, he's exploring and it is a See why you're not. He's not ready to listen, and why he's not ready to stop it is because he is getting some uh, level of pleasure from it, which is more than other things. Yeah. So that is why they keep engaging in it. Now, uh, one cannot physically block or stop that from happening. It's like telling a child, "Don't eat." You know, keep an ice cream in front of the child and say, "Don't eat." He is going to want to eat that ice cream, right? So one is to reduce the opportunity. If you can remove the pillows from your living room for now, and have them only in the bedroom. You know, if that rearrangement can be done, that is, you know, so that the bedroom is the more attractive place, and they, there is where he will do. Teaching in the bathroom, uh, you know, for hand on hand, teaching him to masturbate, I think he's too young for that. So I know I wouldn't attempt that at this stage. Just remove whatever possible from the, you know, public spaces that you have, uh, and see, you know, uh, if he can be redirected uh, to the bedroom without using force. Rather, like you know, the bedroom should become more attractive for him. At that point. Uh, um, the ne next question is: You you said that we must use Kayak body part names. What I fear is that he may often repeat words if I teach him to say them. He might speak them out at any time and any place. That also has to be taught, no? what to speak and where to speak and what not to speak. Even if he uses some other word, you're using 
you know instead of passing urine uh, urine you're saying susu or you know instead of penis you're saying whatever billy or he's going to use it and uh, somebody is going to understand so you cannot have a secret code word but what i would try to uh, encourage is to keep using the word private part also along with the body part you know the penis is a private part so that in public you can say things like don't touch your private part or also encourage him to say you know uh, in public that i'm having some issue with my private part you know to also understand that uh, category of uh, words and tell that when we are in public maybe we don't you know directly say that body we can say it to the doctor we can say it to mama and papa but we don't use the word with everybody okay um we just have three more questions and then we're done um the next question is as my son is concerned he gets sexual feelings when he touches me but when he touches his mother he's normal how can i react he's 16 years old this is from a I th- uh, i think it's from a father yes kamal narayan if you want to unmute yourself and So that's okay i think it's from a father yeah so basically uh, teenagers you know and all of us also we may not uh, the sexual feelings the affection romantic feelings see you know, these are all overlapping areas in our brains you know so uh, he may not be able to do, he may have a lot of affection uh, for his dad he may he or worship his dad and he may not be able to Uh, distinguish the love that he has uh, and the sexual arousal you know uh, sexual is a very um, uh, physical thing but uh, uh, when you touch somebody else and who you really love then you know uh, you may feel that way so he may need to be taught uh, in general that uh, what you're feeling for papa you know any way it is inappropriate to have sexual feelings for papa or mama and so to tell him that you know Uh, i don't know he has not said how he, how he know, you know is expressing the sexuality at that point so to just tell him that whatever that behavior is is not appropriate with papa is all that he needs we still love each other and all that but then you cannot do this um the next question is hello my child is 10 years old he comes in checks the lady's chest part mainly the breast part how to educate him not to do so so checks it for every every thing um i uh, if megana tucker is here she could unmute yourself and maybe give context um and how old is the child uh the child is 10 years old Okay, I don't think the parent is here. On yeah. So, but even otherwise, I think, uh, yeah, this is something that happens with some children, especially, uh, you know, because the breasts are, you know, whatever sensorily, maybe giving them see some feedback, and uh, they may want to sort of uh, do that. But again, it is only training, both when incidental training when it happens to keep redirecting and saying. this is inappropriate that person you know the, the language when we say this is wrong they may still want to do it. but to say that that auntie will feel really bad or that didi will feel really bad if you touch them they don't like it that's their private area they don't like anyone touching it then our children respond better than just saying it's wrong and bad and all that okay um i'm just checking checking for the last question okay uh the last question yeah it is the last okay. question um how uh, ma'am want to know how to stop my son from touching his private parts or shaking his leg by sitting down especially at night when he's sitting down he shakes his leg so it gives him some stimulation you can redirect him to his room at that time and especially because in the evening or night you can say your feet it looks like you want to you know Uh, spend some time with yourself we you don't do it sitting down in a public place can you go to your room if you feel like that okay um sorry one last question cuz the, the it was just the uh ha huh. my son pulls his penis when he's angry how do we make him understand that he will hurt himself pulls his penis when he's angry 
So this is obviously some kind of a habit that has formed, maybe from childhood. Uh, again, as I said, you know, when you touch your private part, it uh, releases uh, endorphins and things like that that make you really happy. So it could be a defense mechanism when he's angry to calm himself. Uh, he's uh, touching. So this uh, will require, a, 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 you know, offline training also. When he's doing it also, try to see if you can give something in his hand at that point, you know, give a push board or whatever, just so that he, it's called a direct replacement with alternate behavior where you give something that prevents him from touching his penis, as well as cognitively making him understand that, uh, you know, when he's angry, what he can do, you know, what he can uh, hold or whatever. Uh, and that, you know, it's not appropriate and he may hurt himself. He does. Okay, I think we can wrap up, right? I, I think it's been great. All right, thank you so much, Akila. This was really, really nice of you to spend so much time. Um, I will share the recording with you as well, as well as all the feedback we've received. So, uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, we are wrapping up. If you don't mind, did, uh, is there anything else? You did you have some concern? Uh, yes, I would like to know. Uh, I would like to ask one question because, uh, very frankly speaking, uh, my nephew was a ten-year-old who is non-verbal. Okay, let uh, uh, Akila, is, this, is it okay? I don't want to impose. Uh, is it okay for you to take a question? It's final, uh, if it's the last one. Yeah, yes. yeah please, I request everybody to, uh, we won't be taking any more questions, please. Yeah, yeah uh, I understand, but uh, this is kind of, you know, for me, it is something which I hold close to my heart. So this boy, this little boy is 10 year old. He is non-verbal. And... Um, he hasn't started communicating as yet. So he speaks one word or maybe, you know, he uh, breaks the sentences and he gives it a little bit. So uh, even he has this um, little thing where uh, he uses, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are audible. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think we lost her. Um, okay. So we can yeah, take okay. that offline. Yeah. Sure, sure. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much, Akila. Thanks a lot. I can. Um, you can. I feel free to uh, exit. Uh, we'll just hang around till we ensure we have all the feedback from everybody. But thanks and once again from my Really appreciate. Thank it. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, okay. Bye.